Topic two is play behavior, uh, which is a slightly more uh, upbeat sort of issue than what I was dealing with before. Um, those of you who've been in the field of animal welfare uh, for a while have known that traditionally we focus very much on trying to identify threats to welfare, we're to minimize the risk to welfare of animals, which is essentially a harm reduction process. And it can give a bit of a grim view of what it's like for farm animals on the farm. The best we can do is minimise damage to them. And I think people are starting to realise that however we keep animals, they are capable of having some positive experiences as well. And to get a sort of balanced view of what it's like to be a farm animal on a farm, we need to look at the bad experiences they have, but also the good experiences that they have. So there's a, a, an increasing trend to try and look at what are the positive sides uh, of the life that farm animals have. It's also true when people are starting to consider the emotions of farm animals. This is a, a scheme that Mike Mendel came up with for classifying uh, the possible emotions that, that animals experience. So he's classified them according to the degree of arousal, whether it's low or high, and also whether it's a negative emotion or a positive emotion. So up in this corner we have fear and anxiety, and these are the sorts of emotions that we've spent a lot of time trying to develop behavioural indicators of. But there's now a renewed interest in trying to come up with uh, behavioural signs that the animals are happy or excited or enjoying themselves. And one of those uh, that has been suggested is play behaviour. If you've ever watched animals playing, it's effectively impossible to avoid concluding that they're having a great time and that they're enjoying themselves. Uh, so this looks like a very good indicator of, of the sort of positive experience that, that animals are having. Uh, if you're not aware of the sorts of play behaviour that cattle show, there was a very interesting paper written by Margaret Magnitson way back when, when she came up with these very cute little sort of pictures of the sorts of play, mainly jumping and running, this locomotive play that calves show. Uh, there's also some sorts of social play where they engage in head-to-head -head butts and something that looks like a little bit like object play. And if I can manage this, I don't know how do I activate my video. This is a video I picked up from uh, Compassion for the Fun. These are adult cows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you get the picture. Uh, in calves, I'll just show you very quickly what they do. In younger calves, it tends to be very much this sort of locomotive play uh, that they show, which is essentially the sort of running and and jumping. It, it's an interesting behaviour. It's got an interesting play behaviour because it's very difficult to come up with a formal definition of what play is. But it's actually very easy to recognise play when you see it. Okay, we, so we've spent a number of, uh, done a number of experiments looking at factors that may affect play behaviour in the way that we keep calves in these smelly, fairly small pens. They don't show a lot of, they don't spend a lot of time engaged in play. Uh, so what we've come up with is a way of provoking play by putting them into a large enclosure like this. And they think if it's a long, thin enclosure, they are be quite happy to spend several minutes charging up and down. So we put them in there for 10 to 15 minutes and we measure the amount of play behavior they show. 
And it's actually fairly well correlated with how much play they show in their home pen. Okay, the bottom line is the, the average running duration in the home pen, and this is how much they show in the, the arena. And that's at each individual car. And you can see that there's a, a reasonable correlation between the amount of play they show in the arena and in their home pen. When I talk about this, I'm going to switch between running and jumping. Uh, which are the two main behaviours. Again, these are fairly strongly correlated. There's a correlation of about 0.91 between the amount of running that they show and the amount of jumping they show. Okay, so what's the evidence that uh, play behaviour is a sign of good welfare or is reduced by bad welfare? So one of the first things we looked at is the effect of um, milk allowance uh, and, and weaning, uh, improved weaning. There's both a low milk allowance and weaning too early are known to reduce the, the welfare of the cattle. This is a, an experiment we've done, and this actually shows digestible energy intake of three groups of calves. So these calves were feeding six litres of milk, uh, and these ones were feeding 12 litres of milk. And you can see that here, the energy content of the ones feeding 12 litres is quite a bit higher than those uh, drinking six. As they got older and began to eat more solid food, the difference in energy intake uh, was reduced somewhat. When these calves were weaned at seven weeks, you can see there was quite a drop in energy intake uh, at the time of weaning, which recovered. And when these calves were weaned at 13 weeks, the drop in energy intake uh, was slight, was a, a quite a degree lower than the drop in energy intake that occurred there. I show that slide because when we then looked at the mean duration of running behavior, of these calves. You can see a very, very similar pattern uh, to what was shown with their energy intake. Okay, the higher fed calves were showing more. Uh, they came together as their energy intakes became similar. When they were weaned, these calves play behavior dropped quite dramatically, recovered, and there was a smaller drop among the later weaned calves. So the, the, the play behavior and the energy intake seemed to go pretty well together. We then looked at individual animals within treatments to see if we could find any relationship between their play and their growth rates. Uh, and we found some interesting correlations before weaning, during weaning, and after weaning. You can see that before weaning, uh, the, the amount of uh, running that they did was positively correlated with both energy intake and the, and the daily weight. Um, we seem to lose that during weaning, but after weaning, it was more or less restored that the amount of play was actually a sign of an animal which was, uh, had good energy intake and was growing fairly well. Okay, other, what are the other sorts of welfare threats that, that may have an impact on the play? One of them that's been looked at has been uh, dehorning. Uh, as you heard from this morning, there's a lot of interest in finding ways of reducing um, the pain associated with dehorning by using the drives with anaesthetics or analgesics. And to just give you some background, this is the, the sort of cortisol level that you find, which is a measure of stress when cows are dehorned. You can see that when they're dehorned, there's a big increase in um, cortisol level. When you only give a local anaesthetic, it lasts as long as the anaesthetic is wearing, but then when it wears off, the cortisol level goes back, so it goes up again. So really to eliminate the pain completely, you need to do a combination of local anaesthetic and non-steroidal analgesics. Interestingly, you get a very similar effect when you look at the amount of locomotor play that occurs uh, when these cars are dehorned in the way, this way. This is work done by Aaron Midline and Cassandra Tucker in, in New Zealand. They had a fairly short-lasting uh, local anaesthetic, but you can see these are control cars uh, for three hours after the, these ones are dehorned. When the, the, the cars were given, there was a big drop in the amount of play that they were showing. The local anaesthetic did not seem to uh, improve that play, but when the cars were treated with local anaesthetic and a non-steroidal, then that basically restored the amount of play that they showed. So again, the play and the cortisol seem to be going together pretty well, which is encouraging. Okay, we've been interested in trying to understand something about the emotional basis of play behavior. And there are two ways that we've been looking at it. One is to look at the effect of novelty on play, because we know from other research that novelty tends to induce fear behavior in animals. So we would predict that if, if play is a sign of 
happiness or lack of fear. And we'd expect less play in the model surrounding. And as the cars get used to the situation, they show more and more play. That was our prediction. In actual fact, we found completely the opposite. That most of the play, the first time we put that them in that arena, they actually showed more play behavior than on subsequent time, which as I said was the opposite of what we would have predicted if they were finding the novel environment um, fearful or aversive. So what we hypothesized was it would depend very much on how the animals are reacting to the novelty. So some cows may react to novelty by showing fear, whereas other cows may react to novelty by showing curiosity and exploratory behavior. So we hypothesized that the amount of locomotive play that the cars were showing in the novel environment would be lower if their main response to novelty was to show fear, and it would be higher if their main response to novelty was to show exploratory behavior. So we put them into this sort of open field, if you like, and the measure of fearfulness that we chose was a long time for them to actually go into the pen. So we bring them to the entrance and let them make their way in. If they're frightened of it, they tend to take a long time to actually get into the pen. We also measure a high frequency of vocalization, a high frequency of defecation. Uh, as a measure of curiosity or exploratory behavior, we looked at the amount of sniffing and licking they did of objects in the pen. And we found some evidence to support our hypothesis. There was no link between defecation, a slight link with, with vocalizations that the animals that did most vocalization did less by. But there was a predicted relationship with the latency to enter. So the cars that took a long time to enter the pen ended up doing less play with running and jumping when they were in the pen. And the opposite was found for our exploratory behavior, that the animals that showed most of the sniffing and licking uh, in the pen were also the ones that were showing most of the play behavior, which suggests that this play is actually part of their sort of exploratory <laughs> behavior complex that they have. So our conclusion was that the amount of locomotive play that the car showed um, really reflects their emotional responses to the novelty. So if they respond primarily by with fear, they're less likely to show play. If they respond to novelty mainly by curiosity, they're more likely to show play. We've just done another experiment where we've been looking at the effect of separating uh, cars from the cow, uh, because this is another way of uh, basically inducing an emotional state in the cars. And this was a, some research that we did in collaboration with Julie Johnson from the National Veterinary Institute in Norway, where because of the, the organic farming that's going on there, they're very interested in keeping cars with the cows for a period of time. The problem is if you keep a calf and a cow together for three days, it allows the bond to develop. So when you do end up separating them, it tends to be much more stressful. So they're very interested in ways of trying to reduce the stress of separating the calf with the cow. And one of the things we looked at was to try and reduce the nutritional dependency of the calf on the cow. So we had three, three conditions. And this, the, the calves were able to nurse and suckle from the cow during the night time, and then they were separated <coughs> during the day. The first group could only get their milk by nursing the cow. So that was, she was the only basic source of nutrients. The second group could nurse the cow, but they could also drink milk from an automated milk feeder. So the idea was that this would provide an alternative milk source. So when they were separated from the mother, they wouldn't show the same sort of stress. The third group could only drink from the milk from an automated filter. So we've put this, uh, this is a new fashion item that we're hoping to sell. Um, sort of lingerie for dairy cows. We have this little bra which covers the, the other so the calf can't actually drink, even though they can still interact with the mother. And after six weeks, we separated the calves and the cows. And what we found, interestingly, if you read the paper, was that the, the weight gain of these two was in, sorry, the weight gain of B and C calves was actually higher during weaning than the A calves. So what we did, we put them into our enclosure and we looked both at the amount of vocalization, which is a sign of distress from being separated from their mother, and the amount of play behavior. So if you look at the, the, this vocalization, these distress vocalizations, you can see the supple only group when they were separated and put in the arena. They did a lot of these vocalizations, which is basically saying, mum, mum, 
<laughs> the ones that had access to the feeder only, and the ones that could both suckle and have access to the feeder showed almost none uh, vocalizations. When we looked at the amount of play jumping, again, you can see the opposite trend, that the suckle only calves that were nutritionally dependent on their mothers um, did basically no jumping, whereas the ones that had alternative food sources um, did as much normal, as much play jumping as they did before separation. We found an interesting correlation, negative correlation between the amount of vocalization and the amount of play. This is vocalization on the bottom, this is play behavior on the top. You can see that the cars that showed most vocalization did less play, although there's a bunch here that do neither. Uh, and the ones that were doing, sorry, the ones that were doing most vocalization did very little play. And the ones that were doing most play did little vocalization. We also found the same correlation we found previously with energy intake after separation. But if the energy was high, uh, then the calves were showing quite a lot of this running and jumping. Whereas calves that had a low energy intake were doing very little of the, about these, these behaviors. And this is, this is a three-dimensional graph where I tried to put the two together. So this is the frequency of vocalization that the calves showed. This is the energy intake that we measured after separation. And the darkness sort of reflects the frequency of jumping. And you can see there's this big cluster. The, the largest frequency of jumping tended to occur among calves that had both a high energy intake and a low frequency of distress vocalization, which leads us to you know, give some support that this is related to the sort of emotional response of the calves to separation, as well as the, the nutritional in, impact. Um, do I have time? Yeah. Okay, very quickly, something we got interested in is whether we can automate measurement of locomotive play. One of the biggest holes in our budget is having to pay students either to watch video or sit there and watch accounts. We can buy these little accelerometers much cheaper than a student, much more reliable. Uh, so we put them on to the leg of the cow and the little hobos and you can see that it, they distinguish, this is the acceleration when a calf is walking and when it's running and you can see that they distinguish fairly well between the amount of, between walking and running. We measure the number of times that acceleration reaches the maximum and we found there's a, a very strong correlation between observed running and this, this acceleration measure that we have is 0.95. So it seems to be a very a reliable measure of the motor, of the amount of running that they show. We look, we redid our experiments on weaning. Uh, this is, this is um, calves, sorry, this is the dehorning one, uh, when the calves were dehorned. This is the, the observed running from the videos you can see uh, on day five, control calves that we weren't dehorned, when they were dehorned, there was a dropping running behavior. When you looked at the acceleration measure, you can get the similar pattern. Uh, this drop in sun acceleration um, for the calves that were dehorned. And we found a fairly strong correlation uh, between the change in the total acceleration uh, following dehorning and the change in the amount of running that was shown from the video. So we think this is actually quite a time efficient, cost efficient and, and reliable way of measuring this behaviour in these sorts of situations. So with that I'll end and say thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, well, I guess the short answer is I don't. I'm not. How, how, do, how, how does one go about validating behaviour as an indicator of positive emotional state? Um, the honest answer is I'm not really sure. Um, but I think you need to do it through sort of triangulation. I don't think there's any one measure that could demonstrate 
that is a sign of a positive mental state. I think it needs coming from different directions. So what we've done is tried to show that it's reduced when we do things that we think induce a negative emotional state. Uh, you could link it with uh, do something like a cognitive bias test, for example. So if you induce a, you know, cognitive biases, okay, well, there are behavioral tests that you can use to test whether a calf is sort of in a positive state or not. So other behavioral tests that would relate to show that that's related to play, play behavior. Uh, you could probably do things like use anxiolytics to reduce anxiety and make them feel better and see if that. So I think there's, you know, I don't think there's any one way which is going to be definitively, but I think if you do a number of different tests, it will reduce, increases the probability that that behavior is an indicator of positive emotions. You know, will they work to get exercise, to get access to an area where they can play, for instance? Yeah, the, the question is, are there dual cars in a group play the same amount, or are there individual cars that um, play more to get things going? Uh, the answer is no, they do not play the same amount within a group. There are big, big differences in how much play goes on. And there are some, there is this sort of emotional contagion, you can see it, that some cars start running and it gets the others going. It would be very interesting uh, to look at what are the what are, are there any sort of long-term differences of cars that play a lot versus those that don't play very much when they become cabs? So yeah, it's an interesting question. Yes, please. Um, so you can throw a wind, like, like you said, that there are um, cars that sort of get things started, sort of like, but you think that would impact the fact that there is only a single path going into this empty space having to go out and explore? Um, how that affect your latency to enter that space? Yeah, I, well, we haven't done the experiment. We haven't done the experiment. I'd love to do it. Um, what what I would like to do if I ever get the time is to, you know, have a calf that runs a lot and a calf that doesn't run very much, and then have a standard calf and see, you know, if it's in with a calf that runs a lot, it also runs a lot, as opposed to if it's in the pen with a calf that doesn't run very much, does it not run as much? To sort of look at that social facilitation. That goes on, and then it's an obvious question. You know, can you can you improve the emotional environment in a pen by making sure that there are happy cards in the pen that play along, and this is transmitted to the others? Yeah, neat idea. In relation to your your first talk as well, what's the producer take on play behavior? Like, watching it, or is it like how that? Okay, so the question is, how do producers feel about seeing this play behavior? Um, well, I haven't done a big survey of them, but it, we went and did a, a tour of some of the farms down in the States, which had just started switching to group housing with automatic milking, uh, automatic milk feeders. And they say one of the advantages of group housing is that they can see the calves doing this, and this actually helps them. Uh, identify a calf that's starting to have problems. You know, that they're not running around as much, that it's a sign that things aren't going well. And also some of the ones that are more honest will admit that they really enjoy watching the calves doing this and it makes them feel happier seeing the an their animals enjoying themselves. Um, so are you there still a study where you have the calves that suckle them up and then they want to the cow? And then the cows are always be there and the cows are always be there. Was there differences in weight gain between the three groups in terms of market weights? Yeah, well, the, like I said, the, the paper's just been accepted in general. Sorry, the, the question was was there a weight gain difference between the calves with their mothers or the feeder? And I can't remember exactly the results. I can't remember if they had a weight drop at weaning if they were dependent on their mother or, or whether their weight gain wasn't as high. But certainly, you know, giving them an alternative milk source did improve their weight gain during that period of separation. That was a question, the last girl, yes, please. Uh, is there any difference in the amount of play behavior between 
I translate that for the web. Uh, the question was too, was there any difference between cars that were housed uh, before weaning and those individual? Um, I, I, I don't know, again, it would be interesting to look at. I would predict that the ones that group house would perhaps show more play. But, but part of the problem is it also depends on the size of the pen. So if they're kept in a small pen and then put into a big pen, they tend to do a lot more running. So there may be a confounding between just the amount of space they have before weaning. Any other questions? Question, what rates of play do you consider normal and their corresponding age? <laughs> 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 what, is, what, what is good or what is bad? Or... Um, the question is how much play is good or bad. Um, well, we only saw it say about four or five minutes in, in these small pants, which I think is probably too low. I, I don't know if I could put a number on, on it. Uh, I think it's certainly something that should be encouraged because there's a lot of research done on other species showing that exercise in young animals you know, is good for future growth, bone growth and so forth. So my feeling is that the more play they show, the better. And I don't think there's any limits. Thank you very much for your time. You notice we've coordinated the wardrobes today. I have not applied for the new dean of OBC. I just thought about it. As many as you, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stone is standing here and has um, agreed to join us today. Uh, we'll soon be ending her term as dean of the Ontario Veterinary College. And members of the Seesaw Steering Committee and myself I really wanted to take a few minutes this year at our research symposium to give her a special thanks um, for her leadership at the center. Now, like many centers at the University of Guelph, the Campbell Center represents a collaboration across various colleges. And in 2007, all university-wide centers at U of G were assigned to uh, a college and a dean for administrative oversight. And um, the Campbell Center came under leadership of the dean of OVC. And I think it's pretty safe to say that we've thrived under the leadership of Dr. Elizabeth Stone. She's contributed many good ideas for uh, growth at the center, and she's also provided the support that's needed um, to bring those ideas to fruition. So in 2007, one of the first activities that we did, if you'll remember, was our first international symposium um, called Caring During Crisis, and it was animal welfare during pandemics and natural disasters. And Dean Stone had assumed her position here at the Ontario Veterinary College um, after um, her term as a professor and chair in the Department of Clinical Sciences at North Carolina State University. And she brought with her the memories of Hurricane Katrina and how she and many of her colleagues in the southern U.S. provided aid to people and their pets who were affected by the storm. And so it was her idea to uh, organize an international symposium um, and we brought people from all over the world um, to share their stories about pets, livestock, and uh, we a laboratory and zoo animals um, that were affected by natural disasters or animal disease outbreaks. And the conference raised awareness and provided lessons to prepare us to help animals and the people who care for them um, in these difficult times. Um, in addition, Dean Stone helped build our team of core faculty within OBC and OAC. She supported the initial establishment of a poultry welfare center here. And following the bequest for Mrs. Mona Campbell, Dean Stone established the Colonel Kale Campbell Chair in Companion Animal Welfare. And as you'll see and have seen during the pre previous session and the session coming up on Companion Animals, both of those are pretty good ideas too. <laughs> Uh, Dean Stone also initiated the development of our strategic plan. She devoted many hours of her own time to participating in the planning exercise. And as you know, the life of the dean of a college, especially as one as large and diverse as the OVC, is pretty busy. And Dean Stone was always there, available to meet with us, available to um, uh, even come to our steering committee meetings. And um, she's promoted the participation of faculty from all over campus. 
and uh, including colleges of arts and social sciences, as well as veterinary and animal sciences. And she's at foster this collaborative spirit across campus. So I think that Dean Stone has shown a true commitment to animal welfare, to the formal animal welfare education for veterinarians and veterinary students, and to the growth of animal welfare stuff, uh, science and studies of human-animal relationships at the University of Guelph. Will you please join me in thanking Dean Stone for the <laughs> Dean seldom get the last word, but I will say <laughs> that I have greatly enjoyed with it, enjoyed the group that's so interested in animal welfare at the University of Guelph. It was one of the highlights that attracted me to the university from the very beginning because of the emphasis on science of animal welfare and the close collaborations between animal welfare specialists and the commodity groups and industry and others in the general public and the fact that things were actually being done that could make real change. And I really enjoyed working with Tina and I'm not going to say that in the past tense that we'll never see each other again. <laughs> And also with the with the steering committee, and there have been some new people that have been hired into a number of different uh, positions, and will continue to carry on the work that Ian Duncan started uh, years ago. Now I can say, and I, I think that there's a very bright, bright future for the Campbell Center. Thank you. <laughs> 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 I 